G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we are fully in draft and free agency and trade period season, uh, which is fantastic. This is my favorite content to make, to be honest, uh, unless you include the videos about me crying about the West Coast Eagles. But uh, I'm actually making a video in response to a comment I received in the last few days from Jacob Moore, who has more or less requested uh, a bit of a breakdown about how the draft actually works. So this uh, reminded me of a video I did in 2021 called A Casual uh, AFL Fan's Guide to the 2021 Draft. In that video, I kind of broke down some of the mechanics of how the draft works and also gave a little bit of information about the draft itself. And I figured I can do a 2023 version. So this video will include some of an explanation of, you know, some of the mechanisms that are involved in the AFL, you know, exactly how trades and draft work and, you know, the academy system, which can be complex if you're a bit more of a casual fan. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the actual landscape of this draft and talent breakdown and stuff like that. I'll, I'll try and keep it interesting. But this video is kind of intense for uh, perhaps a casual fan to really brush up on the draft ahead of the upcoming 2023 one, which looks to be a interesting one. Well, they're all interesting, but it's really interesting because my team has picked one. So before I get into it, if you could do me a favor and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, that's if you are enjoying the content, but particularly if you're interested in more upcoming trade and draft content, it's gonna be coming thick and fast over the next few months. I can't wait. Cool, so obviously we'll just give a little bit of a background as to you know trades, which are going to be happening now. Um, what can be traded first of all you can trade players for players true player for player trades uh, really aren't a thing anymore generally a player is assessed as to what pick value he would be so for instance you know a high profile player swapping clubs is rarely going to be swapped for another a grade player first of all if you didn't know um, the afl unlike american sports all players all parties to a trade need to consent so there's not like someone can be tapped on the shoulder and told you're moving clubs it does happen to a little bit of an extent but at this end of the day you still need the player's agreement and his consent and he needs to be willing to swap clubs. So generally draft picks will be traded for players. Um, nowadays you can just outright trade draft picks. I'm not sure when that exactly happened, but it was brought in maybe 10 years ago, I'm not sure. A good example of this is last year, the Eagles had pick two in the draft. They made an assessment that early in that draft, the players around that range, it was rumored were unwilling to play outside of Victoria, namely Harry Sheasel and George Wardlaw. Again, this is kind of rumor, but the Eagles made an assessment of that. They traded pick two for pick uh, eight and 12, and it would eventually become nine and 14 after academy bids. The Eagles picked up two West Australian talents in Ruben Jinby and Elijah Hewitt and missed out on Harry Sheasel. So that's an example of a club trading picks for other picks. Another reason why that might happen is to accumulate points for academy picks being matched, which I'll elaborate on shortly. So that's how players get traded. There is of course a free agency. Now free agency is uh, only applicable to certain players who meet criteria. You can become an unrestricted free agent at 10 years at a certain club. It has to be all at that club. That means if you're out of contract uh, as a player, you can negotiate with a new club and sign with them and no trade actually has to be facilitated to get that done. That's if you're unrestricted and uh, generally the AFL then will make an assessment based on some criteria, length of contract, size of contract, and uh, you know sometimes it's placement in that team's best and fairest. It's kind of a little bit murky, but the AFL will spit out a compensation pick that will be generated out of thin air and just be in the draft. So an example of band one, Band one compensation may apply to Ben Mackay. So if Ben Mackay signs a large enough contract to, for Essendon, band one compensation would give them a draft pick immediately after their first draft pick, which would be pick three in this scenario. Band two compensation is a pick at the end of the first round, which would be at this stage about 21. So I've covered unrestricted free agents, restricted free agents, which is actually what Ben Mackay is. It's a little bit different. You become a restricted free agent after eight years of service with a particular club. And what restricted basically means is that the team that currently holds you has the right to match the contract offer of the new club. And if that happens, it kind of voids that player's free agency rights and a trade has to be facilitated. So to use the Ben Mackay situation again, if the AFL determines that it's band one compensation and North Melbourne get pick three, North Melbourne are probably gonna say, you know what, we'll take that. However, it's been rumored that if it's band two compensation and that's you know essentially pick 21, North Melbourne then have the power to match the contract offer and force Essendon into trading their actual draft picks or players for Ben Mackay. There's other ways you can become a free agent at a club. It's a little bit less common, but one example is James Jordan, who has played three or four years at Melbourne. 
He qualifies as an unrestricted free agent purely because he was previously delisted and relisted by Melbourne. So that's just a quirk in the system. So James Jordan can join Sydney as an unrestricted free agent. Also, a lot of the time, even if you've only played eight years at a particular club, if you are not within a certain salary banding at that club, you will be an unrestricted free agent. So you're only restricted if you're in the top, I don't know, 10 paid players in the club. I don't even know if that information is is it changing all the time or if it's even public, but some players will be unrestricted free agents at the end of eight years. Then there's the listed free agents and they can pretty much join anyone and they don't have to go through a draft or trade mechanism. If a club decides that that player is no longer required, they can simply cut him from their list and he can walk to any other club. So that's a background on trade and free agency in particular. Now we'll talk a little bit about the draft, how the draft works. It's uh, intended as an equalization measure so that the worst teams get the earliest picks in the draft and the best teams get the latest ones. So then there's rounds. So West Coast finished last this year. They should hold pick one in this year's draft provided they don't trade that pick. Collingwood won the premiership, so nominally speaking, they should have pick 18, but it is going to get pushed back. Each club has to make at least three list changes. Usually that means they have to take at least three draft picks, but there is an exception if a player is upgraded off the rookie list that can count as a list change and therefore a draft pick. So the draft order is rarely actually truly indicative of the reverse order, and that is because you can trade future picks now. So this year, if you look at the draft order, it's kind of all mixed and matched. One example is that Fremantle traded a future pick last year for Luke Jackson, which means that Melbourne currently hold Fremantle's first pick and they currently hold pick five, even though they also hold their own first rounder. This is a resource I'll get up on the screen now. This is Law's Provisional 2023 Draft Picks. And this is what I use. It's from Bigfooty, so credit to Law. I'll try, if I remember, to put the link in the description of this video as well. But this is sorting every club's picks in order of the points value, which we'll talk about shortly, that each pick cumulatively holds. So in terms terms of North Melbourne's uh, draft hand. So for instance, they've got two, 14, 19, 40 odd, blah, blah, blah. That gives them five and a half thousand points. They technically hold the strongest draft hand in this year's draft. Law updates this all the time. He does a pretty good job throughout the season. As soon as the round's finished, uh, I find that this has been updated. Of course, it might get a little bit messy throughout the trade period because there's going to be deals every day. And I, I presume this guy has a job. So either way, I found this to be the best resource for keeping up to date with live picks and stuff like that. Cool. So if you have a basic understanding of how the draft actually works now. Let's move on to the academy system. And this is a relatively new uh, innovation by the AFL in the last got it, I don't even know, five or 10 years. Maybe we'll give you the father-son example first. Um, obviously, there's a rule that if your father played 100 games for a certain club, the son is then eligible to join uh, as a father-son pick. This is, of course, uh, has to be consensual. The player can turn it down. So in addition to the father-son uh, example of a club having access to a player, Will Ashcroft is a good example of that. We have the Next Generation Academy and the Northern Academies, and these are both initiatives to try and uh, broaden the game. So Next Generation Academy talent, I think, is more or less designed to, for clubs to have an academy for young players outside of you know conventional footballing streams. You know they might not have played at the best footballing private school. They might be from a rural area. So if a club has invested in a player, played them through their academy and you know, certainly contributed to their development, they will generally have some degree of access to them or priority over them when it comes to the draft itself. This also is the same concept for Northern Academies and Northern Academies refer to the academies of Sydney, Brisbane, Gold Coast and GWS and the criteria is a little bit different. Essentially how Academy and Father Son picks get picked up is a club will bid on them. So for instance, um, I'm trying to think who bid on Will Ashcroft last year. It would have been North Melbourne, I think. North Melbourne bid on Will Ashcroft at pick two last year after GWS took Cadman. Brisbane then can match that bid with a certain amount of points. Now I will talk about the point system after this little segment, but essentially Brisbane have to accumulate points and they can do that with three or four picks that total up to a certain amount of points to match a bid for Will Ashcroft. And that's exactly what happened. So Brisbane then got pick two and Will Ashcroft. In that example, I think pick two is worth about two and a half thousand points, which means that Brisbane can use three or four later picks to tally up two and a half thousand points. And then there's some sort of 20% discount, which I don't know why that exists, but they use those picks, which then get absorbed out of the draft and Brisbane get picked two. And in some cases, if the 
those picks still don't quite add up that pushes down a later pick. So this was also possible previously with the Next Generation Academy talents as well. So an example of this is in 2020, Jamara Ugelhagen was bid on at pick one by the Adelaide Crows and he was a Western Bulldogs Next Generation Academy talent. So in the same way that the Brisbane could match points for Will Ashcroft, the Bulldogs used later points to match a bid worth about 3,000 points minus the discount. And the AFL sort of absorbed those draft picks that the Bulldogs had and then shot them up to pick one and they took Jamara Ugelhagen. There was a bit of backlash for this because I think there's an argument out there that suggests that some of these players who get drafted through the academy uh, system were always going to be footballers. There are plenty of examples where the club has generally helped and supported a player, you know, from a regional area who might not have had the opportunity to play AFL. But there are plenty of examples of players who get drafted through the academy system that were always going to be footballers and therefore it's an unfair advantage to certain clubs. So long story short, as a result of this backlash, the AFL instated a new rule that any bids that come in the top 40 for next generation academy talent specifically, they can't be matched. So if you have a next generation academy talent uh, and they fall within the first 40 picks, you no longer have priority over them. If they get bid on at pick 41, you can match with points. This in itself is problematic and probably a topic for another video, but essentially it kind of disincentivizes trying to invest in players. So it really has had the opposite impact. An important exception is this top 40 lock does not apply to the Northern Academies. Gold Coast is a good example of this. They have three players in the likely to go in the first round this year that are all part of the Gold Coast Academy. One of them is likely to go pick two in Jed Walter. Gold Coast can accumulate points to match that bid, no problem. But if it was Collingwood or the Western Bulldogs, if a bid comes in the top 40, the, those clubs can't match bids. So I think the, the idea there is that, you know, the Northern states in New South Wales and Queensland are obviously rugby states. Those clubs are getting a leg up, but anyway. So give you a little snapshot of this upcoming draft. Uh, like I said, there's three Northern Academy players likely to go in about the top 12, uh, which will push everyone down because Gold Coast, if they match a bid, all the other picks get pushed down one. The Bulldogs have a father son in Jordan Croft. The Hawks have Will McCabe likely to go in the top 20. The Swans also have Caden Cleary, which could go in the top 20 or 30. He was an Australian talent in under 18s this year. Uh, North Melbourne have Riley Sanders technically as part of their next generation academy. However, again, because they're not part of a Northern Academy, if a bid comes in the top 40, they they can't match it and Riley Sanders will probably go top 10 so it's probably irrelevant. Uh, West Coast have Lance Collard which is a chance to go earlier than 40 or he might go after and Fremantle have Mitch Edwards as well who is sliding down the rankings he probably won't get all the way to 40 though. So a little bit about the points uh, index which I indicated before so like I said if you if you look back at that uh, at that laws uh, provisional draft rankings. Every draft pick has an attached value to it. So pick one has 3000 points. And then uh, I've got it here in front of me. Uh, anything from pick 74 has zero points and pick 73 is worth nine points. So how's that work? Uh, you know, to match a bit at pick one, which is 3000 points, maybe picks five and 10 are uh, added up to combine to enough points for 3000. I don't actually know off the top of my head, but that's more or less how it works. The reason this was instated is because it's actually harder for clubs to try and come up with points for talented kids. Previously, what would happen is, I think Isaac Heaney's example of this, what would happen was if you had an academy or father son pick, uh, you would simply absorb your next pick in the draft. So I think Isaac Heaney was taken at about pick five I can't remember exactly. And all Sydney had to do as the team that finished runner-up in 2014 was match the bid with their first pick, which was about pick 17. So all Sydney had to do was uh, say, yes, we'll match it with pick 17 and they get a top five talent for pick 17. Now clubs have to do a little bit more legwork to try and accumulate points. Uh, it's still a bit of a farce, to be honest, in my opinion, but it has made it a little bit more annoying for clubs. And it does actually give opportunities to other clubs to trade up in the draft. So an example of this is Gold Coast currently hold pick four. Jed Walters probably getting on bid on on pick two, which means Gold Coast can trade pick four out of this year's draft, give it to another club and get some later picks in this year's draft. That enables them to get a little bit of value for pick four because they can't really use it. But it does give North Melbourne an example, for instance, to trade three later picks for pick four. In that way, it, it does kind of make it exciting for other clubs to try and trade up into the draft. But overall, it's a little bit of a rort how compromised these drafts are getting. I know I've gone really heavy into exactly how the draft works, but I'm trying to uh, answer the question as best as possible, uh, but we'll talk a little bit specifically on what the 2023 draft looks like. So this is quite a compromised draft for the, some of the reasons that I went through. It's uh, becoming increasingly compromised through academy picks. Now I like father son. I like the tradition of that rule, and but the academy picks really have blown it out a little bit. Like I said, there's three 
certain top 20 picks going to the Gold Coast this year and potentially two in the top five or seven. Like I said, Jed Waltz is probably going pick two. There's a couple of father-sons in Croft and McCabe which should go uh, top 20. And again, that's five players I've mentioned so far that will push everyone else down the draft order. Then there's potentially Caden Cleary. He could bolt into the top 20. We're not sure. We saw a couple of surprise top 21s last year in Michael Annie and Harry Ralston. Um, so again, that could happen again this year. So the ongoing compromisation... Is that a word? The ongoing nature of these compromised drafts uh, have become an increasing headache for, well, fans and the AFL itself, I reckon. But if we talk a little bit about the strength and depth of the 2023 draft, um, one thing that I will say that assessing a draft in terms of the strength of that draft is not so much just about the top end talent and how good the top players are. It's also about the, you know, the, the depth of the draft, how many good kids there are in a given draft, and also the depth of talls. You usually make an assessment of whether a draft has good talls uh, or not. And last year was a year bereft of good talls and this year, by comparison, there are plenty of good tools. So speaking specifically about this year, I'd say the top end looks pretty damn good. We've got potentially the best ever number one prospect, certainly the most AFL-ready number one prospect in Harley Reid. But generally speaking, uh, it's considered a little bit shallow. We might only get 50 to 55 picks, which has become an increasingly worrying trend in the AFL, I would say, with the draft pool each year it seems smaller than ever. But one unusual characteristic of this year's draft is a distinct lack of quality pure midfielders. A lot of the players in the top 12 or so, I think about half of them are likely to be tall, which is really rare. And uh, other than McKercher and Sanders, those are two genuine pure midfielders. There's a lot of other like utility players, players that play multiple positions. They're half forward. Maybe they roll through the midfielder. They're small forwards. A lot of running defenders in this year's draft. So, you know, you factor all of that in when considering uh, what to do with your first pick. I know that next year is supposed to have a really strong top end of midfield talent, which might influence clubs with early pick this year you know for instance west coast or whoever whoever is expecting to be bad this year and next maybe they're less inclined to go for a midfielder this year because next year there's probably going to be just midfielders available in the top five i shouldn't say only midfielders available obviously if you have a top five pick you, most of the pool is going to be available but you know what i mean you don't want to have pick three and then reach for a, a tall defender because you missed out on one this year i hope that makes sense the other unusual characteristic of this year's draft is the amount of allies talent. And allies, uh, if you don't watch the under 18s, um talent competition that they have, allies refer to the non-traditional football states. Well, specifically New South Wales and Queensland, Northern Territory as well, and Tasmania. I'm sorry, I know that Northern Territory and Tasmania are footballing states slash territories, but they all play for the same team and therefore they're called allies. So the, the strength of allies talent is really strong this year. Of course, they did win the national championships, but we have three likely top 15 Tasmanian picks, which is pretty rare. So the strength of talent coming out of Tasmania in the last few years is quite impressive. We've got McKercher, Sanders, and Leek probably going in the top dozen to 15. And then there's another guy called Ari Sean maker probably goes top 30 at this stage. There's three first round Queensland talents, which is also really rare in the Academy boys. And Walter probably goes pick two. So six players from uh, Queensland and Tasmania is potentially justifying the fact that maybe the game is growing outside of the traditional footballing states. We also have Connor O'Sullivan, a New South Wales key back, probably likely to go top 10. So interestingly, a lot of talent outside of the traditional footballing pathways are getting, um, well, getting front and center in terms of this year's draft. Now, one more final thing. I know I've really rambled in this video, so I'm hoping you're getting something out of it. But one thing I will say about this draft is that there is considered to be about eight players considered in the elite bracket at the top. You do have Harley Reid right at the top. He's considered pretty distantly the best, but one thing I'll say as a caveat to that is he's the most physically mature. He's dominated since he was 17 because he's built like an AFL player already. Um, to be fair to him, he has gone up and played pretty well at VFL, you know, men's football already. But regardless, he's probably considered the best number one talent ever, um, you know, in terms of the snapshot of how good he is at this age. To list some of the other players that I believe are considered in that top eight bracket, uh, Colby McKercher, Jed Walter, Zane Dersma, Nick Watson. And then there's three that I'm not sure if everyone else agrees on this, but this is my take on who the next three would be. Ethan Reid, the other Ruckman from the Gold Coast Suns Academy. Riley Sanders won the Lark Medal for best player in the national championships, the under 18s competition. And I believe the next one is Nate Caddy. So picks in that top eight range have a little bit of a premium on them. Not an actual premium on them, but it, with clubs deciding whether or not to trade that pick, that will certainly be front of mind. And equally, there might be clubs trying to trade from, say, pick 11 or 12 into that top eight because there is a clear increase 
increase in talent. That being said, there is a lot of water to go under the bridge until the draft, in particular the draft combine, which, you know, different people will have different assessments of whether the athletic testing of these athletes is actually super important. But each and every year, I swear, we see more young players bolt from outside the top 30 rankings into the top 10 or first round or whatever purely because of how well they've tested. So we'll see how that all goes. There is a lot of water to go under the bridge. But like I said, you know, one of the other big interesting things about this draft is that potentially in the first 12 picks, I reckon there could be six talls in Walter, Curtin, Reed, O'Sullivan and Caddy, if you consider him at all, he kind of plays like an undersized key forward or midfielder. And then Jordan Croft and Oli Murphy are also in that mix as well. So that's actually seven players that I named there. Wow. But anyway, guys, that is a long winded sort of snapshot of what this upcoming draft is. So obviously at the start of the video, I went through some of the mechanics that uh, make player movement possible, how the draft works before finally giving you a bit more of a uh, outlook on the landscape of this upcoming draft. So I hope that was helpful. Maybe I could have planned this video a little bit better, but let me know in the comments what you thought and hopefully in the future I can clarify further issues as well. But appreciate all your support on the channel. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.